Good evening and welcome to the Vancouver Aquarium in our program tonight. My name is Jonathan Holquist. Have you ever uh, been walking down the street and you hear a siren coming along? I've done this with my daughter with me and what I say to her is, sweetheart, just cover up your ears so that when the sound goes by, it doesn't hurt your ears. Well, our speaker tonight is going to talk a little bit about how cetaceans, whales, dolphins, and porpoises might actually have this ability. They might actually be able to protect their hearing from loud sounds in the ocean, which has a lot of application, especially as noises in the ocean increase so much. Uh, our speaker is from the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. Uh, he's been studying uh, cetaceans and their hearing for over 40 years and is a well-known expert in the field. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and invite Dr. Paul Noctegal to come on up here and give us our presentation tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jonathan. This has been a wonderful day that I've spent here at the Vancouver Aquarium. I've really enjoyed the people. Uh, I, I really sense that people care about the animals and it's a wonderful opportunity for me to be here and thank you very much for a great day here at the Vancouver Aquarium. <clears throat> As Jonathan, Jonathan said, I'm at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, which is a, an institute of the University of Hawaii. I'm located at uh, Coconut Island or on Coconut Island. Our whole institute is a 24-acre island, which is uh, in Kaneohe Bay on the windward side of Oahu. And my office is in that small building you see toward the bottom of your screen there. And that's our Marine Mammal Research Program building. And from my office, I look out and I can see our marine mammal uh, pen enclosures. And it's a great place to keep marine mammals for our laboratory. And uh, we have very clean water. We do bacterial counts and it's nice, warm, tropical waters. And uh, it's located right off of very nice coral reefs. And it's a great place to do marine mammal research. These are our marine mammal residents. To the left, you'll see our false killer whale, Kina, and our two bottlenose dolphins, Boris and BJ. Kina, I think, is about 40 years old. <clears throat> I acquired her from, the, uh, from Hong Kong, from Ocean Park in Hong Kong in 1987. And we've been doing a lot of interesting, I think, uh, echolocation and hearing research with her over the years. Our two bottlenose dolphins, we're both born in our breeding colony. One is 27 and the other 29 years old. They're an active breeding pair and they had a really nice calf uh, seven years ago who now resides at Sea Life Park in Hawaii. What we do is to test hearing by examining evoked auditory potentials. And uh, that's because there's a number of reasons that you want to be able to test hearing. And if you do behavioral tests, uh, sometimes if you ask the animal to tell you whether it hears something, it takes a while to do that test. But it turns out with evoked potentials, you can do it relatively rapidly. And what we do is we train the animals to wear little suction cups, which you can see right here. They're little rubber suction cups containing little gold electrodes that only go on the surface of the skin. And uh, here you see our false killer whale, Kina, wearing some black suction cups. And above that, you see my colleague, uh, Alexander or Sasha Supin from the Russian Academy of Sciences. He's a fine ele uh, Russian electrophysiologist, and he really developed this technique for measuring hearing. Um, there's been others that started before him but he really perfected it and we work together twice a year. Usually he comes for a month or so, uh, usually in the fall and the spring, and we look at hearing using evoked auditory potentials. Now, why can you pick up these great big evoked potentials from the surface of the animal's skin? It's because they have nice big brains. Now, I got this slide from my friend, <clears throat> uh, Sam Ridgway, 
Now, one of these brains is from a young bottlenose dolphin, and the other is a brain from a young human. So you can see which is which. A lot of people say the dolphins have such big brains because they're very smart. They may, may well be very smart. But another thing that they do with that brain is to control their hearing. And they do a lot while they echolocate to be able to control their hearing. And their brain has a lot to do with that. So the evoked auditory potential hearing measurements that we take have a number of good reasons for measuring hearing that way. In fact, if, you, if you're aware of the way that we study uh, infant hearing, most infant babies, human babies, within their first week of life have their hearing tested in a very similar way now. So if a baby's born, usually in a, in a traditional hospital these days, the baby has its hearing tested with evoked potentials in the first week of life. But we have applied that situation to the um, evoked potentials of animals as well. And we can quickly measure the hearing of stranded animals. If an animal strands, we can find out how well it hears if it's stranded because of some hearing deficit. We can also quickly measure the hearing of animals exposed to loud sounds in temporary threshold shift type experiments and also measure the hearing of animals during echolocation. So how do you measure hearing using brainwave responses? <clears throat> if you take a look at this graph, you take a look at the top where it says ABR, you'll see a black line and a little red line. <clears throat> the black line is a brainwave response. The red line represents sound. The sound is presented as a little envelope of sound that's only a thousandth of a second long. And the black line is a response to that little bit of sound. So you'll see a nice, big, robust response of the brain to a little pip of sound. If you then take a bunch of those pips of sound and string them together, whoops, my apologies, folks. If you take those pips of sound and string them together, you get a nice response you get a nice response and a nice sinusoidal type um, response in the brainwave patterns. Now that's really a nice thing to be able to take a look at and it's also very functional for doing hearing measurements. It's very functional for a number of reasons, two of them being that <clears throat> there's a graded response. So if the sound is not very loud, you get a very nice soft response. If it's quite loud, you get a good, good, vigorous response. The other is that the waves tend to follow the wave patterns of the sound. So you can look at what's being followed, the sound that's being followed, to see if the animal's really following your, your sound. And two, you can see how much of a, of a response there is to it, so you can know how loud it is for the animal. We've used that in a number of situations for what we call audiograms of opportunity, an audiogram being a test of how well the animal hears sounds across the frequency spectrum. And in this case, we did a test of the hearing of the long fin pilot whale. This long fin pilot whale, Nazare, <clears throat> stranded off the coast of Portugal um, of a place called Nazaré. Those of you that surf or come close to surfing know that Nazaré is a place that has huge surf off the coast of uh, northern Portugal. And this pilot whale stranded near that surfing spot and hence was named Nazaré and nursed back to health by the people at the Lisbon Zoo, much like the animal here was nursed back to health. So they asked us to come over and take a look at its hearing. Nobody had ever measured the hearing of a uh, long fin pilot whale before, so this is the first audiogram on a long fin pilot whale. The, this is the actual audiogram. You can see this is from four kilohertz up to over 100 kilohertz on a log scale. And you can see that the lower the line, the better the animal hears. And the animal hears best about where the peak of its echolocation signals are. Of course, you can do these sorts of tests not only in a nice aquarium or dolphinarium. 
You can take the equipment and do them on a beach as well. This work was conducted <clears throat> off Maui on a beach at Kihei. And my colleague here uh, sitting on the beach over a black, uh, black box of equipment is Ode Pacini. We blew up a, a, a tank, put the animal within the tank, and measured this animal's hearing shortly after it beached itself in Kihei, Maui, this pygmy killer whale. Once again, the audiogram showing very similar to that of the long fin pilot whale with the best hearing down around 40 or 50 kilohertz or so. So you can test hearing of stranded animals very rapidly using evoked auditory potentials. But it's nice to measure just basic hearing, but it's nice to know more about echolocation as well. So before I go into testing hearing during echolocation, let's talk just a bit about echolocation itself. Echolocation is fascinating. The animals produce a very short bolse, uh, purse, bur <laughs> a burst pulse of sound. And every whale species so far examined has been shown to echolocate. The animal produces the sound, bounces that sound off an object, usually a fish or a squid, and then catches the echo as it comes back. Different species or groups produce different types of clicks. Large toothed whales like, uh, like sperm whales produce some sorts of clicks and others produce different kinds of clicks depending on the environment and the species that they're going after and what they've evolved to chase down. Sperm whales, the 60 meter or 20 meter sperm whale, one third of a sperm whale is its nose. The nose is for making clicks. So it's an absolutely fascinating animal acoustically because one third of all that mass is made for making echolocation clicks. The echolocation clicks tend to be relatively low frequency or in the 20 kilohertz or between 20 and 30 kilohertz peak frequency. The harbor porpoise, very small one meter harbor porpoise, tends to have peak frequencies in an FM sweep type pulse and tends to be above 100 kilohertz. So they're both echolocating, but they're going after different sorts of prey in different sorts of environments and have different sorts of evolved echolocation signals. Very interestingly, echolocators make very interesting loud sounds. Particularly, that's not echolocation. <laughs> Particularly the sperm whale. The sperm whale makes the loudest sound made by any animal. 238 dB is an incredibly loud sound. My friends Bertel Mole and Peter Madsen like to go out and measure the clicks of the echolocating sperm whale. And they take their equipment out. And in order to calibrate the signals of the, off, we're using their equipment when the sperm whales aren't there, in order to make a click as loud and as sharp as a sperm whale click, they actually go out and throw small explosives into the water, cherry bomb type of explosives, in order to make the sounds that might be as loud and as a big sperm whale's click. So 238 dB, but then you take a bottlenose dolphin. My friend Whitlow Al's study, <clears throat> when a bottlenose dolphin was in Kanyoi Bay and looking for a three inch water filled stainless steel sphere as far as it could look, was making some clicks at 230 dB. So they're very loud, very short, but very loud. So that's fascinating with echolocation, but then stop and think about hearing. What does that mean for hearing? If you had a rifle shot or a cherry bomb go off right inside of your head and your ears were also inside of your head, what would that do to your hearing? So I've always wondered about that particular question. What does the animal hear when it's echolocating with just making these really loud sounds? and how can we measure it? So we started measuring hearing during echolocation by looking at evoked auditory potentials. In order to measure hearing during echolocation, you have to make sure that the animal is echolocating and that you can pick up the outgoing click and the echo. So we've trained our false killer whale, Kina, to swim into a 
small hoop here to echolocate out onto targets where you can precisely know the distance by presenting them at different distances with these different ropes hanging down. And if she, in fact, knows there is, a, sees the target with echolocation and tells us it's there, she tells us by hitting a little ball. So we have very precise control and know that she, in fact, echolocated and she tells us there's something there. And we can, we can look at what she hears through her wearing the suction cup devices and know what her outgoing clicks are and measure them as well. So here's just a bit, a uh, little diagram of the, the same sort of situation where bottlenose dolphin is looking out, targets are presented at a precise distance, and a hydrophone is picking up the outgoing echolocation clicks of the animal. Now, how do we know what distance and how the echo comes back? Well, the two-way travel time of sound is very precise. So if the animal makes an outgoing echolocation click, bounces that click off of a target and it comes back, we know precisely when that echo is going to come back. We know when it goes out, we know when it's going to come back. So we measure what the animal hears of the outgoing signal and the returning echo using evoked auditory potentials. And while measuring the hearing during echolocation of our false killer whale, we found that the returning echoes are heard at the same level as the much louder outgoing signals. And the echoes may differ by over 35 dB, which is a great deal, but they're heard at the same level. How can that be? How can you produce these very loud sounds and get a little quiet echo back? How can they be heard at the same level? This is some of our initial data from our paper published in 2004. And I'm going to take some time and just sort of look at these data. Remembering what I said about hearing and brainwave patterns, that is the bigger the, the pulse, the better the animal hears it. We did an experiment where the animal was presented targets at varying distances from one to eight meters. Ah, keep doing that, I apologize. And here's one meter, and there's eight meters. And you can take a look at these data for yourself. First of all, if you take a look at how big the responses are to the outgoing pulse and the returning echoes, you'll see it's just about the same on those two. Another thing you need to know is that the outgoing pulses remained about the same no matter what the distance to the target was. You also need to know that in eight meters you lose a substantial amount of energy for it returning back. So first of all, the animal heard the signals going out and the signals coming back as far as the echoes at the same level. But secondly, that even though there is about a 35 to 40 dB difference between this echo coming back and this echo coming back to the distance, you'll note that these are about the same size. So all this is to say to you is that something's going on in that animal's head to control its echolocation hearing. Why is it doing that? I think it's doing that to maximize what it hears of the echo returns. Because what's important in echolocation is not so much what's going out, it's the information that's coming back. So then another observation of the data came around. And that is, when you're doing an experiment in an echolocation, in order to make sure that the animal is really echolocating, you have to have target present trials and target absent trials. So you'd present a target sometimes, and the animal echolocates, and, and it comes up and hits a little ball and say, yep, target's there. Sometimes you have another, another trial, and there'll be no excuse me, there'll be no target at all. The animal has to look and say, nope, no target, and so it doesn't hit the ball. So you have target present and target absent. So we found something very interesting. Even though it produced clicks at the same level, it heard the clicks at a different level 
in target present and target absent trials. Well, that was interesting. And we thought, why would the animal hear differently in target present and target absent trials? So the animal heard its own clicks 20 dB more sensitively in the target ab absent condition. So if the, it was a relatively easy echolocation task, the targets were right in front of it. So when targets were there, it's relatively easy. You don't have to do too much. If it's target absent, you're not too sure. You have to look harder. So when the target echoes are lowered, returns are lowered, either by making the targets smaller or placing the targets farther away, the animal hears the echoes at about the same level without changing the levels of outgoing signals. The difference in echo levels by dis distance is more than 35 dB. The, wh the whale does have mechanisms for controlling what it hears. Did we have any further hearing control evidence? Well, we did another experiment. We thought, well, we've got to sort of put all this to a test. And so we used two different size targets. We used bigger targets and smaller targets. And rather than just look at what the animal heard of its outgoing signal, we said, OK, so we're going to have the animal doing this task, and we're going to present a 22.5 kilohertz tone. And we're going to say, what do you hear of this 22.5 kilohertz tone in target present and target absence situations? Once again, in target absence situations where the animal really had to look for the targets, we had one sort of response as far as hearing goes. When the targets were present, just sort of look around, we got another. So the whale's overall hearing sensitivity changes by 20 dB depending on whether the targets are present or absent. The animal hears better when it's searching for the targets. So then you say, what is the mechanism for that? How can the animal do that? How can it change its hearing? Well, you have a mechanism for changing your hearing. If you yell really loud, you make the sound yourself and you yell really loud, you have something called an acoustic reflex or a stapedial reflex. You have three little bones in your middle ear, and your middle ear is an amplification mechanism, and one of those bones has a little muscle on it, and what happens is the acoustic reflex, that little muscle, your stapedial muscle, will pull tightly and take away that amplification. So you have an acoustic reflex. It could be that they, these animals have a very pronounced and more controllable acoustic reflex. We think it's much more than that. We also think that there's a lot of neural downward or efferent control going on as well. But there's a lot of reasons for that that I can't go into tonight. <clears throat> so we do have a lot of data indicating a lot of control and changes of hearing in different sorts of echolocation tasks in different situations. So we had this, all this data on echolocation, and so we got to thinking. We're all concerned about loud sounds in the ocean. We're concerned a lot about impulsive sounds. We're concerned about sonars. We're concerned about oil companies with going out and exploring for uh, oil and air gun arrays, which also produce very loud sound. And so given that, and given that we know that the animal controls its hearing, we came up with the question, suppose we gave the animal a warning. Suppose we gave the animal a warning sound that said, here comes a big sound. And we didn't do anything other than just give it a little warning sound. What would the animal do? So the question was, does the animal also have an active control of hearing sensitivity for loud sounds coming from the outside? Can the animal change its hearing sensitivity to outside sounds like it can its own loud echolocation signals? And can this active control of hearing be used to mitigate the effects of loud sound on dolphin and whale hearing? So our method was to establish baseline hearing measurements for a sound just before a loud 170 dB or with a beluga whale 150 dB sound, pair a neutral warning signal, a quiet version of the loud sound, presenting it immediately before the loud sounds, and measure hearing in the quiet warning sound each time and observe the threshold change, 
and see if animals learn to change their hearing quickly. And what we found using our false killer whale is that the whale reduced its hearing sensitivity about 15 dB when it was warned about the arrival of a loud sound. If that was between one and nine seconds, if the, the warning was between one and nine seconds, the animal effectively lowered its hearing by, raised its hearing actually, by 15 dB. If in fact you didn't give it, if it wasn't a timely warning, and it was 20 to 140 seconds, there was essentially no effect of changing the animal's hearing. So, if our whale learned to change her hearing when we presented a warning before the loud sound, what does that mean for other free swimming cetaceans, the wild ones? Most of our current mitigation for loud sound is practice based on finding and identifying animals. A brief warning sound presented before each loud impulsive sound could serve as a self-mitigation tool. The wild animals may quickly learn through classical conditioning to adjust hearing sensation levels when they are provided with a warning. So if you plug your ears with earplugs or go like this, you change your hearing by about 15 dB, the same amount that these animals tend to do without having fingers and um, ear holes to plug up, but they do it internally. So does it work for just the false killer whale, or does it work for other animals as well? So the next species we worked with was the bottlenose dolphin. And these data, I think, are pretty convincing that it worked very effectively for the bottlenose dolphin as well. We then got very interested in Arctic species in the beluga whale, Delphinapterus, and wondered whether that whale would also change her hearing. So we were invited by the people in Valencia at uh, Oceanographique, the park there, a really wonderful park in Valencia, to try it with their beluga whale. So we had the opportunity to do our hearing tests and play our loud sounds. In this case, it was kind of a, she was a very less trained animal than the animals we'd been working with. And so we used only 150 dB instead of 170 dB short sound, and only two seconds as opposed to five seconds. And once again, we used two, well, not once again, but this time we used two frequencies, 32 kilohertz and 45 kilohertz. This work isn't published yet. I just sent it off to the Journal of Experimental Biology two days ago. So this isn't published yet, folks, but uh, I think it's pretty solid stuff. Once again, the beluga whale showed the same sort of shift, but interestingly showed a larger shift with the higher frequency. So the 45 kilohertz showed us a bigger shift in hearing <clears throat> than the one at 32 kilohertz. So the beluga whale, the bottlenose dolphin, and the false killer whale, all echolocators, show this ability to, sh to change their hearing with simply giving a warning. No training, just simply giving a warning. So all three species show learning to shift hearing sensitivity by 15 dB when a warning sound is paired. The suggested application for oil exploration could be that rather than immediately ramp up, as they do now, to shoot one air gun as a warning sound immediately followed by a whole array. And the question is, would that be equivalent to one quiet sound followed by a loud sound? I think so. I also suggest that loud Navy sonar pulses might be preceded by a quiet pulse. The hearing change appears to be a classically conditioned phenomenon. All that is required is a pairing of two stimuli. That means that it should work on wild populations as well as those found in the laboratory. So that's a nice rosy picture, but I'm a scientist. So I should be conservative. So what else needs to be known before this is applied to wild animals in the field? Well, first of all, adaptation for the high frequencies is really an adaptation for echolocation. 45 kilohertz is more effective than 32 kilohertz for belugas. What about low frequencies like those found in air guns? Is the same thing going to apply for low frequencies? It's a very good question, and I haven't explored the low frequencies yet. We haven't. 
We need to verify that the hearing change is a classically conditioned learned response. How long does it take for the animals actually to learn? We have some idea, but not exact. Is there extinction? Is it really classically conditioning? Is there, if there's extinction, is there recovery? If the quiet warning is no longer paired with the loud sound, how long does it take for the animals to forget it? If you wait a while, is there spontaneous recovery? Verification, this, these would verify that it is a learning phenomenon, and that's critical to a field application. What about other species like the harbor porpoise, Riso's dolphins, or beak whales? Does it apply to them as well? So with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and listening. Thank you very much. And if you have questions, Uh, yeah, so we'll go ahead and do our Q&A. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, grab our mic. So we're going to have some questions from our online audience as well. Uh, we'll take our first question right here at the aquarium. Thank you for coming. Uh, the question I have, I, I used to be a radar technician when I was younger. Um, the question I have is, is the burst, is, is it pulsed? And is it, can it also be aimed into azimuth and elevation? Yes. It can, <laughs> it can be aimed anywhere you want to aim it. And there's a couple of ways they can do that. First of all, they go, most of them have a pretty mobile head, except for the sperm whale. But most of them have a very mobile head, and they can aim it anywhere they want by one, changing their whole body, or two, changing their neck and aiming it anywhere they want. Third, the, um, there's new work by one of my students, Laura Klepper, who's been working on actual focus and changing in direction by the melon. If you're aware, they have the melon, part of the anatomy of the, of the echolocation system is that melon, which is a nice bulbous fat uh, and oil thing surrounded by a lot of nice muscles. And everybody has always believed that the animals focus their outgoing echolocation beam using the melon. And nobody's really measured it until Laura has been doing a lot of nice measurements lately. And she's published two papers recently, and she's got a couple more in the shoot. But I think that um, the most effective thing that they have is to change their body angle or to change their head. But there is some fine change as well within the adjustment of the melon by all those fine muscles around it. How is the signal received? Is it through the lower jaw? And I saw on the orca, three little apertures, it looked like they were very, at various sizes with various frequencies. Is that the case? Well, that depends who you talk to. <laughs> um, it was really a nice, wonderful picture when we all believed Ken Norris's hypothesis that everybody heard through their lower jaws right here. It was a nice, clean, wonderful world when that was true. As it is now, it's kind of messy. That is, um, there's a lot of empirical data to be gathered before I could stand before you and tell you where the animals heard best. Um, one of my students, uh, Kristen Taylor, did a, an interesting experiment for her dissertation in which she looked at how well the animals heard as a function of what direction the sound came from and what frequency it was. You would think that an animal would hear sound equally as a function of you know, what, what frequency it was, but they don't at all. That is, if they're very high frequency, if the sound is high frequency, they hear it best from right here. If it's lower frequency, they tend to hear it best from over here. So there's a difference in how they hear it as a function of what the frequency is. The other thing is, is there's a lot of things going on in the literature right now as far as, as far as, you know, where do they, re what are the best sound paths? There's work by Supin and, and, um, and uh, his colleagues on different sound paths, not just one south, but, but multiple sound paths. Um, there's work right now on finite element models by Cranford and his colleagues indicating that there might be a Guler pathway where the sound is best heard here. My colleague, um, <clears throat> uh, Ode Pacini has been looking by putting contact hydrophones on the heads and looking around, something we did with Bertel Mole some time ago, has been looking at 
sound contact hydrophones, where do they hear best? And our false killer whale with a broadband click appears to hear best when you put one right here. And uh, so it varies with the species, it varies with the frequency, so there is no simple answer to your question. Can I just Ask him. <laughs> just a question, is it pulsed or, or Doppler? There is no Doppler with these animals because of the fact that um, the animals don't move fast enough and the speed of sound in water simply doesn't allow Dopplers to be a good, Doppler to be a good cue. I'm going to take one online question. Can you all hear me all right? So we had an online question come in. Uh, the question was, um, we can see the, the clear benefits uh, of working with these animals uh, in the laboratory, uh, but is there, is there any potential for harm to the animals that you're working with when you're doing these tests? Um, we're very careful when we do these sorts of tests, given that we are using relatively loud sound, 170 dB, uh, I don't think that there's any harm for two reasons. One, it's very short sound and way below what has produced temporary threshold shifts in other animals. And so temporary threshold shift is sort of that benchmark for that you look for some sort of harm. It's what we have used uh, across time for humans to determine OSHA standards for, you know, what is too much sound. And we don't go close to that with these sorts of tests with our animals. Um, so we really don't think that there is any harm at all caused by our animals. The animals uh, get used to the loud pulse coming after the, after the quiet pulse. Uh, it's not their favorite, but it's worthwhile, I think, to do this sort of work. They don't swim away in, in anger or give any really bad displays or anything, but it's, uh, I don't think we're causing any harm at all. Uh, th thank you uh, for that talk. Um, what are these evoked potentials measuring? It's a, great, it's a great question. I would have the same question before I started. It's really very simple. Um, you just put a little electrode on top of a, on the animal's head right up here and one on the back and you just measure um, the evoked potential, produce, the sound produces the evoked potential and you just measure the the difference in response of the brain with sound and without sound. So it's, a, it's, the, it's, it's the response of the brain. It's some it's sort of electrical activity in the brain. It really is the, the overall response of the brain. And uh, it's measured in microvolts. We can go down to nanovolts, but usually in microvolts. And to get a nice clear signal like you're seeing there, it usually takes an average. But it's just simply in terms of microvolts, an electrical response. And it's a small electrical response of the brain in response to sound. Thank you very much. Um, apart from the, of the stapedial ligament, do you think that they also have other mechanisms that can protect them from the very loud sounds that they hear? Yes, I do. I think that anatomically there are protections so that they hear differently their own sounds. If you take those same sounds that they produce and you, produce, you present those same sounds back to them, they hear sounds that they produce that you present back to them much better than their own sounds that they produce themselves. Meaning that I think they uh, have an anatomical protection as well. So there are, if you stop and think about how the ears are, are protected from, uh, from the skull and everything else, all the protections, the anatomical protections that go inside, they are built to protect them, uh, the hearing as well. Yeah, uh, I don't mean from their own sounds, but from the surrounding sounds that they want to receive. Do I think there's others than, uh, than what I've been looking at? Love to know more if, if you think there are other mechanisms. Because, for example, the type 2 neurons that we know that they protect us, um, they don't have them very well developed. So that makes us wonder, they must have something else that works so well with them and yes. that, they, that we don't have. So what do you think that they can be? Um, that's, that's what I started to talk about and stopped. 
Um, the whole thing about efference coming down and uh, changing things, I think that that's very important and it's a big part of it. If you, if you look at the bat literature, the echolocating bat literature that Suga did back in the 1970s, um, they also showed a big ability to change their uh, hearing in, in the outgoing uh, and also um, not so much in the return, but the outgoing signals. And what Suga decided is that it's um, partially stapedial, but about uh, 50 to 70 percent, depending on the situation, uh, neuronal. So if you go back to the Suga literature, and I, I don't know the neuroanatomy like you know the neuroanatomy, but uh, there's a lot of, the, uh, of that coming down from the cortex and, and controlling what's going on within the cochlea. Now, there may be other spots as well, but that's the current thought on that. <coughs> and if you know more, I'd like to hear it. No, no, we didn't observe any um, explanation for that. That's why. For what we know so far, we didn't observe any um, explanation that can, you know, lead us to answer this question. That's why I'm wondering if, if you have uh, other ideas. No, we don't do any neuroanatomy or any sort of active uh, neurophysiology or, or anything like that. We, we stay with the behavior and the things totally from the outside. So we're very fascinating. The animals have this ability. And so far, we only guess what's going on on the inside Thank based you. on what other people have done. Thank you. That was a short microphone pass. Um, Paul, I know it's much harder to work on mysticetes. Have you had any opportunities to do audiograms on any of these uh, sort of opportunistic opportunities to do audiograms on, on mysticetes? And, and would you care to speculate about what kind? Mysticetes, baleen whales don't echolocate, it's at least not in using burst pulses. I, I would love to have the opportunity. I have a permit. I would love to have the opportunity to measure the hearing of any mysticete. Um, myself and about nine others all got together to try to chase and catch and tag for the release a mysticete whale off Iceland. And so we thought that based on work that we had done with white-beaked dolphins, that we would be able to temporarily catch, test the hearing, and release a minke whale. So we attempted that. We spent a month in Iceland. We had a nice ship. We had really good people. We had uh, a good ship's captain. We had a good ship. And what we learned about minke whales that summer is two things. Minke whales are very smart, and minke whales are very fast. <laughs> but we don't know anything more about minke whale hearing <laughs> than we did when we started. Would you care to speculate then about what they might have in terms of uh, protection against intense sounds? They're not protecting against their own sounds in the same way. I don't, no, I really, I can't speculate about protection when I don't even know what they hear. But there is a great interesting paper that just came out by Ted Cranford on bone conduction in, in the minke whale. Um, and I haven't even had a chance to read it yet. I, I know a bit about it from talking to Ted, but I'm really interested in reading that. So there's, there's things going on about the possibilities of hearing based totally on modeling. And Darlene Ketton also has a really interesting model uh, on minke whale hearing and uh, Ted Cranford. So there's modeling going on and it really needs empirical justification and, and whatever. So it, it's an exciting area and somebody's got to do it sometime soon. And I think it'd be wonderful if we, if we had the opportunity to do it in, in some sort of situation. We tried and we weren't successful. In humans, um, it's not just loud sound that um, stimulates the stapedius muscle, it's also tactile and motor stuff. So maybe it's the production of the echolocation that's also signaling stapedius muscle uh, to protect the ear, and then that wouldn't apply as much to an incoming loud sound. That's a great observation, thank you. Do we have any more questions? Okay. Uh, Paul, thank you very much for coming this evening. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, everyone here, thank you for coming to the Vancouver Aquarium and joining us for this uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, we have some upcoming programs. So next week on February 10th, we'll have Dr. Anna Hall back here talking about the 
uh, vaquita, which is uh, the world's most uh, endangered cetacean. And uh, then we have our Sea Monsters Revealed lecture series coming up starting on March 3rd. Uh, and there'll be a whole bunch of programs related to monsters. Uh, so you can check out the aquarium's webpage for that. Uh, thank you so much and have a good night.